have a true legend of cinema. He was the film star of the 1980s. His charitable foundation has raised over $2 billion. He was Marty McFly in Back to the Future. Michael J. Fox! Today we're going to be talking about Parkinson's and what's happening in the Parkinson's brain. I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Alan Snow. So, Dr. Snow, how long have you been studying Parkinson's disease? Well, you know, it's about over 20 years now that I've been studying Parkinson's. You know, 19 years ago, in 2005, I was one of the first to get the Michael J. Fox Foundation Leaps Award. It was a three and a half million dollar award. I looked it up and I don't think they give it out anymore. So the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's disease research started in the year 2000. So imagine that it's been around 24 years. And in 2005, five years after they started, I was able to get a LEAPS award, which stands for linked efforts to accelerate Parkinson's solutions. So that was pretty cool. So what kinds of medical conferences and events do you attend to stay current on everything that's happening with Parkinson's disease? So, you know, every few years I used to go to all the Alzheimer's disease conferences, you know, and I'm one of the few researchers in the world that has been studying misfolded protein disorders. And what's misfolded protein disorders? Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, different amyloid diseases in which a misfolded protein accumulates, like in inflammation or AA amyloidosis, immune globulin, light chain amyloidosis, known as AL amyloidosis, transthyretin amyloidosis. These are all different proteins that fold into a predominant beta sheet fibril manner. And I've been studying them for the last 35 years. So I'm one of the few experts in the world that has been looking at misfolded protein disorders. And as far as Parkinson's, disease. I've been going to the Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease medical conferences. So get this, they have a conference, used to be every two years, now every year, in which they have research, worldwide research on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, both in the same conference. So some of the same mechanisms that occur in Alzheimer's disease actually occur in Parkinson's. For example, the AD, it's called the ADPD Medical Conference. In 2024, it was in Lisbon, Portugal. In 2023, it was in Gothenburg, Sweden. In 2022, it was in Barcelona, Spain. In 2021, during COVID, it was actual virtual. So people were just going online and doing their presentations. So most of the time, I usually give a presentation on some of the research that I do with Parkinson's disease. So I know you mentioned a few minutes ago the LEAPS Award. And I, if I remember correctly, you said that was through the Michael J. Fox Foundation that you did some Parkinson's disease research with the, with the LEAPS Award. Could you talk about what the LEAPS Award stands for and what, what is the LEAPS Award? So they don't have it anymore, but in 2005, I got a three and a half million dollar grant. You know, you have to apply for all these grants and they're peer reviewed. So they're very hard to get. They only give out one a year. In 2005, I got one of the first few LEAPS awards and LEAP stands for Linked 
efforts to accelerate Parkinson's solutions. So it's pretty interesting. And Michael J. Fox Foundation gave me the award. I actually had about five different institutions and we were developing a small molecule drug that targets alpha synuclein. We're gonna talk about it. It's the main protein in Lewy bodies. And Lewy bodies is what accumulates in the Parkinson's brain. And, you know, I was able to get that. You know, and Michael J. Fox Foundation is quite amazing. I was looking up how much have they raised since they started. Guess how much that money they've raised in for scientific research studies since the year 2000. Take a wild guess. Since the year 2000. So it's right, so 24-ish years. years. Yeah. I'm going to go with somewhere in the magnitude of 225 million. They've raised over 2 billion dollars. That's un believable and you know a little bit of michael j fox i met him when i was in new york i went to new york when i first got the grant funding i had a company this was my first company and we were developing small molecule drugs for alzheimer's and then parkinson's and we actually remember we talked about we were developing polyphenol like drugs so based on the characteristics of a polyphenol we actually developed small molecule drugs and we had a few candidates that looked very good. Just Michael J. Fox, a little bit about him. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 1991 when he was only 29 years old. You know, and now I don't know if you've seen him lately, but you know, he has a lot of the movement problems that a Parkinson's patient has. You know, there's not, we're gonna talk about drugs and treatment there's some drugs that help a little bit with the movement, this problems, disorders, tremors, but they're really just hitting the symptoms for a bit. So now he's 63 years old and he has lived with Parkinson's most of, about over half of his life. And like I said, he, he started this foundation in the year 2000. And then in 2005, I was the only one to get the Leaps Award form the michael j fox foundation which was really amazing for me yeah that is amazing so let's go through what is parkinson's disease so parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disorder so what does that mean neurons are dying but it's a little bit different than alzheimer's disease because it's in a different area of the brain so it's in the area known as the substantia nigra. And what's in the substantia nigra? There's dopamine producing neurons. So what you're losing is dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter. So remember when you go to like YouTube channels and then everything flashes on, you're actually getting dopamine hits, right? It gives you some sense of euphoria and what happens in Parkinson's is it's also involved in movement. So walking and moving, you know, your limbs around. And once you start losing dopamine cells, you have movement problems. And that's what Parkinson's is all about. So what is actually happening in the brain? You said it's a neurodegenerative disorder. So what's actually happening in the brain of a Parkinson's disease patient? So it's a progressive movement disorder that occurs when the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra are lost. And the pathological hallmark, so you remember in Alzheimer's you have beta amyloid protein that forms plaques in between neurons and tangles or periodical <laughs> elements inside neurons. In Parkinson's disease, you also have a problem inside neurons and you get aggregates inside the cell of a misfolded protein and this one this protein is called alpha synuclein and you get these bodies inside these neurons known as Lewy bodies so at autopsy you could actually see the Lewy bodies and pick them up but again you can't pick it up as far as Lewy bodies in a live patient although they are looking for specific markers and we'll talk about some of the things that have happened in the last few years. 
So Parkinson's disease is primarily affecting movement, and it's estimated that over 10 million people globally are living with Parkinson's disease. And the 10 core million. Problem, 10 million. Wow. Yeah. The core issue is the loss of dopamine producing neurons, substantia nigra. And like I said, dopamine is essential for regulating movement and coordination. And when these neurons die, the dopamine levels go way down and you start to get the motor symptom problems that are characteristic of Parkinson's, such as tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement. It also affects other systems and can cause constipation, sleep problems, cognitive problems, and depression. And some people report, just like in Alzheimer's, they lose their sense of smell. And, you know, it's interesting. I was doing a lot of research and basically clinicians say, if you met one person with Parkinson's, you met one person with Parkinson's, that's it. Because everybody's individual. So everybody will have their own mix of symptoms and there's no standard trajectory or path. So when you see one Parkinson's patient, they may have certain problems and the next person who comes in may have different problems. And this becomes a whole different regimen and how to treat them. So not every Parkinson's person is treated differently, which is quite interesting actually. So what I find really interesting as somebody who is learning a ton about this topic, dopamine is really the core piece that you're talking about. So I'm curious, why is dopamine so important and what exactly does it do in the brain? And, and I'm also curious, what does it have to do with movement specifically? Like, why is it so important when thinking about the control of movement? So, you know, in Alzheimer's disease, they went after neurotransmitter acetylcholine, but it turned out not to be working very well as a treatment. For Parkinson's disease, dopamine actually is a transmitter as well. So you remember a transmitter is usually going from one nerve cell to another and there's a electrical connection. And it's a chemical messenger that transmits signals between nerve cells in the brain. And these cells are critical for controlling movement and coordination. So in P Parkinson's disease, as these neurons are dying, the brain's ability to control movement is deteriorating, and that's leading to the symptoms that you actually see in Parkinson's disease. Okay. So that's why dopamine's so important. So I'm also curious about, I think you mentioned Lewy bodies, and I'm just for the, for the sake of the audience, I'm curious if you could spell that if people wanted to look into it further, but what are they sure. and how do they contribute in, in Parkinson's disease? So Louis bodies, Louis is L E W Y. I don't know if it's named after a person or, or why they named it this way. So Louis bodies, B O D I E S. So they're abnormal clumps of protein that form inside neurons. Remember when we talked about abnormal clumps of protein, that's what happens in Alzheimer's disease as well. So here in Parkinson's disease, you just have a different protein and that protein, the main component is a protein called alpha-synuclein. Maybe we could show the actual structure of alpha-synuclein, it's a protein. So in healthy brains, alpha-synuclein plays a role in synaptic function. So what is synaptic function? Again, in order to talk to each other, you have synapses that are sending neurotransmitters from one neuron to another. And you remember, even to remember a thought, you have to connect from different areas of your brain. So there's a lot of importance in communication between neurons. Well, the same thing happens in Parkinson's, but now we're talking about movement. The neurotransmitter is used for movement. And if you start losing dopamine in these neurons, that's a problem. So what happens is this protein starts clumping up it misfolds in aggregates and that leads to neuronal death. So 
you're losing neurons, but not losing neurons that are important in memory, although some of these people have memory loss. It's important in losing neurons that function for movement, to walk, to move your hands, to control you know, your speech, swallowing, those type of things. And as in Parkinson's, as these neurons are dying, the brain's ability to control movement deteriorates and that leads to what you see in the brain. And in healthy brain, alpha synuclein is playing a role in synaptic function, but in Parkinson's leads to neuronal death and then this disrupts normal cell function is a key feature of the disease. So it's a problem with movement. And you know, obviously you, if you ever seen, you know, Parkinson's patients in films or documentary or Michael J. Fox, you could see all the problems they have with movement controlling it. So I know with a number of the diseases that we've talked about, neurodegenerative diseases, we've talked about what role is environmental factors, dietary factors, but we also talk a lot about the genetic components. What role do genetics and epigenetics play in the development of Parkinson's disease? And how does that compare with something like environmental factors? It's a great question, Scott. So Parkinson's, you know, it's unknown what really causes Parkinson's. There are genetic factors and just like Alzheimer's, a small percentage will actually, if you have a mutation in a specific gene, about 10 to 15% of Parkinson's actually runs in families. But what does that mean? That means the other 85% are what's known as sporadic. All of a sudden one person in the family actually gets the disease. When it's in familial disease, there's mutations in specific genes like One's called LARC, L-R-R-K-2. Another one is PARC-7. Don't ask me what they stand for. P-A-R-K-7 and PINK-1, P-I-N-K-1. So these are all genes where they found mutations. Probably someone had Parkinson's in the family and then somebody's mother had Parkinson's and you start to see it in the family tree. But that only occurs in about 10 to 15% of cases. Most of it is sporadic. So some people believe it's a combination of environmental factors and some sort of genetic factor that they haven't found yet. You know, we could talk about it, but I believe heparin sulfate proteoglycans are playing a role in Parkinson's, just like we talked about coming up in another episode where I talk about its effect in Alzheimer's disease. Guess what? Heparin sulfate's found in Lewy bodies, exactly where the alpha synuclein is aggregating. So there's that common constituent of heparin sulfate proteoglycan playing a role in misfolded protein disorders, including Parkinson's. Other people think that exposures to pesticides, heavy metals, and even head injuries may be linked to increasing the risk of developing Parkinson's. And the interplay between th these factors is complex and still under investigation. So it's not really known what's causing it. But remember, they're getting an abnormal protein inside a neuron. You remember we talked about CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is what happens to football players, and they're getting tangles in the brain. So these people are not getting tangles in the brain, but they're getting abnormal clumps of a different protein inside neurons in the brain. So, so actually, to me, it's quite amazing how all these different proteins and diseases, you know, all come very, have similar things going on, like abnormal clumping of different proteins. So I'm glad you mentioned CTE, because I'm really curious. One of the things we had talked about with the research of Dr. Anne McKee was as she was looking at some of these CTE brains, you're able to look at different stages and severity of the disease. But you also mentioned that the clinicians that you've talked to have said that the the experience for each individual looks really different. I'm curious, is there any way to diagnose the severity or to are there any kinds of stages that that are used when thinking about Parkinson's disease? 
So remember in CTE, we, um, Dr. Ann McKee actually had four stages, more tangles is stage four, less tangles stage one. Same sort of thing in 1967, Hahn and Yard defined five stages of Parkinson's that are based on clinical disability. And basically it's the clinician using it to describe how the motor symptoms are progressing in Parkinson's. So it's the same sort of thing. Stages one to two are early stage, two and three are mid stage, four and five are advanced stage. So for instance, we can go through some of these. Stage one, you have mild symptoms that are generally not interfering with your daily activities. Interesting daily activities they look at. They look at daily activities for, for Alzheimer's patients as well. You know, how well are you at putting on a shirt, dressing yourself, brushing your teeth, same sort of thing. It's called daily activities. One quick clarification that I'm also really curious about. Can they diagnose this when somebody is alive with Parkinson's or those stages for those that are alive with Parkinson's then? So we're, we're going to talk about diagnostic tests, you know, some research that is actually breakthrough later on. This is just going to a clinician and he's doing a physical exam and looking at the person's movement, right? Can they okay. walk clearly in that? Or having questionnaires that are uh, filled out by the person or the person's family members. So just think of you have a person sitting in front of you and you're asking them a bunch of questions, usually to a movement disorder doctor, which is interesting. That's what they're pushing people to see. So in stage one, you have mild symptoms that don't interfere with daily activities. And you may have tremor and other movement disorders only on one side of the body. And you may have changes in your posture, your walking, facial expressions. So that's like very early. Stage two, the symptoms start to get worse. Tremor, rigidity, and other movement symptoms affect both sides of the body. You may have walking problems, poor posture may be apparent. And the person's able to live alone, but the daily tasks are becoming more difficult and lengthier. So that's stage two. In stage three, the loss of balance is the hallmark. So if you ever see somebody, you know, can't walk properly, falls are more common. Motor symptoms continue to get worse. The person's somewhat restricted in their daily activities now, but they're physically capable of leading an independent life and disability is mild to moderate at this stage. It starts really getting worse when you're at stage four and stage five. So stage four, of Parkinson's symptoms are fully developed and severely disabling the person to walk and stand and probably needs a cane or a walker and they need significant help with activities of daily living and at this point they're unable to live alone. Okay, that's stage four. And stage five of Parkinson's is the most advanced, most debilitating stage, stiffness, and the legs may make it impossible to stand or walk, and a person is bedridden or confined to a wheelchair unless aided. Around the clock here is required for all activities. Hmm. So that's about the five stages of Parkinson's disease. So you said those were developed in the in the 1960s. Have there been any other ways of measuring Parkinson's that have come out, or any other like scales that are? that are used by clinicians or researchers when trying to understand Parkinson's, given that it's a, it's a pretty complex disease. So now they have all kinds of rating scales. It's like through the charts and they're used by clinicians to characterize Parkinson's disease. You know, I can give you tons of examples. One is the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale or the UPDRS. It was developed in the 1980s by PhD researcher and it contains four parts. And you know, a lot of these are questionnaires and they're looking at mental health, behavior and mood, activities of daily living, motor examination. So this is a physical and then complications of therapy. And then later on, it's been revised, and now there's a unified dyskinesia rating scale as well. 
and it's an expansion of the UPDRS. It's more comprehensive and it evaluates various aspects of Parkinson's disease. And then you have things like the Schwab and England activities of daily living scale, where they use percentages to assess a person's level of functional independence to complete daily chores. And other things like Parkinson's questionnaires, looking at non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, non-motor symptom scale for Parkinson's disease. So there's all kinds of, I think, questionnaires. You remember in Alzheimer's disease, they do the same thing. So if you get an Alzheimer's patient potentially into a physical examination, you know, they have them draw a clock, you know, what time is it? Who's the president? Where are you? Same sort of thing with Parkinson's, except they're really interested more in the motor movement. So they're having their family or them actually fill out all these questionnaires, you know, and it goes on and on and on. So you just talked about the motor skills. How does someone get put in, say, stage one of Parkinson's or how is that identified for Basically, how are you diagnosed with, with Parkinson's? Yeah, so the, the question is, how is Parkinson's disease diagnosed? And by the way, we're going to talk about research, which is really interesting. I, I found some new findings that they're excited about. But usually the diagnosis, again, is based on a personal medical history, answering certain questions and a physical examination. So. They're now touting that people should be seeing movement disorder specialists. So it's a neurologist who has specialized training in Parkinson's and other movement disorders. In one examination, the doctor is looking at slowness, stiffness, resting tremor. So what's a resting tremor? You know, put your hand like this. And if, if it's starting to shake, that's one of the signs of potential Parkinson's disease. So you're getting a tremor when your hand's in a resting state. And then balance problems. Uh, and it's basically the movement symptoms of Parkinson's. Now get this, there's now a new biomarker test available to diagnose Parkinson's objectively. And it's based on the presence of, guess what? Alpha-synuclein in the cerebral spinal fluid. So it's actually called the alpha-synuclein seeding amplification assay. And this test can now detect misfolded alpha-synuclein in the spinal fluid, in the CSF, in people who show clinical symptoms of the disease. And so it's really interesting how they do this, you know, and it makes a lot of sense for, you know, in Alzheimer's disease, you could light up the tangles and plaques using a fluorescent stain called thioflavin S. So here they're also using a fluorescent agent. And it's interesting how they do it. I think it's actually quite brilliant. So they take the cerebral spinal fluid, they do a spinal tap, and then they introduce first a fluorescing agent. And the solution is gonna light up if clumps of alpha synuclein protein start to form. So what do they do? They add normal alpha-synuclein to the spinal fluid sample. And what happens is the normal alpha-synuclein will make any synuclein in the cerebral spinal fluid tend to roll and clump together. And when it clumps together, it lights up and it, you could quantitate it. So that's quite amazing. If someone has misfolded alpha-synuclein, you can barely see it. But when you add synuclein to it, it forms a snowball the snowball then lights up with a marker that fluoresces and then you can quantitate it. Get this, they're finding this in 93% of the people who have Parkinson's, su suspected Parkinson's, and they only have less than 5% false negatives. So mm -hmm. Michael J. Fox was raving about this. If you go on his website, maybe I'll bring up some clips. They're very excited because it's a biomarker for Parkinson's by taking the cerebral spinal and looking into it. And guess what's really amazing about this is even if you don't have any movement disorders, the alpha-synuclein could start the misfold and turn up in the CSF. 
So they could detect it early that you could be a candidate for Parkinson's disease if this assay is starting to show plumping and lighting up. Wow. So speaking of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, what did you do with the the Leaps Award? What kind of research have you done in the world of, of Parkinson's? You know, to find a drug for anything is hard as heck. And when I got the Michael J. Fox Foundation Leaps Award, our title was of the grant was New Small Molecule Inhibiting Agents for Alpha Synuclein. Guess what I was going after? Alpha Synuclein and Lewy body formation as disease modifying treatments for Parkinson's. So even in 2005, when there wasn't you know, lots of research on Parkinson's, I knew that this misfolded protein, alpha synuclein, that is present in Lewy bodies is key. And uh, we talked about, so our idea was somehow get a drug into the brain, get it into the cell. So that's hard. You got to get into the brain, then into the neuron that has Lewy bodies in it. Or you try and inhibit the formation of alpha synuclein, how it aggregates in dopamine producing cells. So that's an important target. And we started working on polyphenol drugs. I think we had made about a thousand and then we had 250 that we actually synthesized. And then we selected small molecule analogs and we found a few that were actually able to inhibit and disrupt alpha synuclein from aggregating. And then I was working in cell-based assays with uh, Ben, Dr. Ben Wallison from Boston University. We we're also looking working with two organic chemists, um, Dr. Anil Kumar, who is the CEO of a, of a group here called Med MedChem Source in Seattle, and then Dr. Manfred Weigel, who was the co-founder of Ariad Pharmaceuticals and former group director of chemistry research at Hoffman LaRoche. So you know that big drug company, Hoffman LaRoche. So then we were testing also in sophisticated biophysical assays in collaboration with Dr. Dan Kirshner at Boston University, looking at CD spectroscopy. So this is the same stuff I did with beta amyloid where it forms a fibril and it's a beta sheet. The same thing happens with alpha synuclein. So we actually had some lead compounds. Then we are working with a group out of University of California, San Diego, Dr. Eliezer Maslia. Guess what? He's the head of neuroscience now at the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Aging. So we were close to a few candidates and you know it became can they get into the brain well what's their pharmacokinetics what's the oral bioavailability what's the blood brain barrier penetration so we had some but they weren't getting into the brain enough they weren't hitting the target enough and so you know it's on a year-to-year -year basis and about the third year michael j fox foundation decided to pull the plug so they funded us for a while, we got close, but we couldn't find the one candidate to really go in. And by the way, there are probably 10 to 15 drug companies now trying to find this, trying to mm -hmm. find a molecule that can get into the brain. So that's the first obstacle. You gotta take it, a pill, or inject it, or inhale it, it has to cross the blood-brain barrier. If it's a pill, it has to have good oral viability. We talked about that in a lot of our videos. Once it gets into the brain, guess what? It has to find the substantia nigra. Once it finds the substantia nigra, it has to go into the cells because inside those dopamine producing cells is where the alpha synuclein is accumulating. So to find a drug that could hit all these characteristics, that's going to be one in a hundred million. And people are working on it, but it's very difficult and it's going to be very difficult. And we found it very difficult, but we worked on it a long time. We were close, but I think, you know, using our information, other companies are looking at it and trying to uh, retweak the system to find something that's even better. And that's going to be the magic, looking for the magic pill. So clearly there's not a magic pill at this point, but how do people mitigate 
the symptoms and how do they best treat Parkinson's at the moment? So basically there's nothing out there that's going to stop the progression and basically cure the disease. A lot of the drugs out there is trying to deal with the symptoms and movement problems that these Parkinson's patients have. So one of the drugs that most people use is levodopa. It's the most common treatment and they're trying to replenish the dopamine that they're losing in the brain. But you know, a lot of these drugs have side effects. And in fact, sometimes the side effects are actually worse than the actual disease. So it really depends on the person, but some of the side effects I looked it up of levodopa are confusion, blurred vision, chest pain, headache, diarrhea, hallucination, dizziness, muscle aches, constipation, loss of appetite, difficulty breathing, trouble sleeping, vomiting, cough, ear congestion. <laughs> Yeah, I, I stopped when I got to number 15 in the list. So, but people take it because there's nothing else out there. It's a pill and it's absorbed in the blood. It, it goes from the small intestine and actually travels through the blood to the brain and there it's converted into dopamine. So that is quite amazing just to get to that point, but you have a lot of side effects from this drug. So guess what? You got to take another drug with the levodopa. <laughs> so people take it in combination with the drug carbidopa. So you got to take both. And what carbidopa does is it reduces or prevents the nausea that levodopa alone can cause. So you're taking other drugs to deal with the first drug. And, um, Carbidopa, levodopa, so there's combinations now, and they have immediate release pills or controlled release pills or time release pills. In addition to pills and capsule, you can get intestinal gel called duopa. Isn't that like a singer? And then you can even inhale it called Inbridja. Uh, I don't know about any of these, but you know, this is what people have to deal with. And then there's other things like um, monamine oxidase inhibitor that's helping to increase the amount of dopamine available in the brain. It's an enzyme that breaks dopamine. So if you have an inhibitor to stop the enzyme from breaking it down, you're trying to elevate the dopamine levels in your brain. And some people say that could improve many Parkinson's disease movement symptoms. But again, these are going to have to be customized to each person. And some people taking these drugs are going to have significant side effects. Some will have less. How do you know? You got to take it. And you got to try titrating different doses. So the first year, I think people are like taking one dose, seeing if they have a side effect, drop, fall over constipation, nausea, sleep problems, all this stuff. And if it's too much, they got to lower the dose and then they got to test it out and they test it out on themselves. So it's, it's a big problem. Pick your poison. Yeah. Pick your poison. So with the, these drugs, they have on times, off times, on times, off times. So what does that mean? So when the Parkinson's disease medication is effective, uh, and control, that's an on time. But as the disease gets worse, the drugs tend to fade and you have more off time. In other words, the movements are sporadic and spastic. So I would guess that before Michael J. Fox comes on stage, they time the pill where his movement disorders are less, right? But then in an hour or a few hours that wears off in his Parkinson's can be very noticeable. And this happens with everybody who are taking these class of drugs is that it only works for a certain amount of time, right? And as the disease gets worse, you're going to have the time when you can take it when you can't. And at a certain point, you're going to run out of hope because the drugs aren't working. And basically Parkinson's is progressing so bad that 
the dopamine levels are not being increased no matter what. You just have too much loss. So mm. let me talk about one other therapy, which I didn't really get into I st until I came across a documentary that I watched called Matter of Mind, and it's on PBS, Amazon, Apple TV, or PBS Passport. It's called Matter of Mind, My Parkinson's. And guess what the treatment is? It's called deep brain stimulation. Guess what they do to treat Parkinson's using deep brain stimulation? Guess what the procedure is? It sounds like I, I might not want to know, but uh, please. They actually cut through the skull while the person's awake and they stimulate portions of their brain and they say, do you feel this electrode? Yes, he has to be awake to respond. So they got to find the right place to put an electrode, completely saw through the skull. Person's awake. Shocking. I watched this in this documentary, it was unbelievable. And then at the end, they have an implant that goes into their chest. And so what it's doing for the worst cases of Parkinson's is actually stimulating the dopaminergic system trying to stop the movement problems. You know, sometimes it may work to some extent, a little bit, a little bit better, but you know, some people are desperate and mm -hmm. they're willing to go in because I remember a lot of these patients were young in their 40s, late 30s, early 50s. So what's some of the latest research and advances in in Parkinson's disease, like what are what are some of the the studies? What are some of the theories of the underlying challenge of how, why Parkinson's is? So there's you know all kinds of stuff, just like in Alzheimer's, where they're going after research. They're looking at the gut microbiome, the immune system, whether neuroinflammation has anything to do with Parkinson's. They're looking at advances in gene therapy, stem cell research, um, neuroprotective treatments, hoping to slow the disease progression and potentially restoring the lost function. Um, and of course, they're going after treating alpha-synuclein aggregation to prevent the formation of Lewy bodies. And once it's there, trying to reduce Lewy bodies. You know, I still think Heparin sulfate proteoglycans are important. They accumulate with alpha-synuclein. If you actually take alpha-synuclein heparin sulfate, you can aggregate the alpha-synuclein into a misfolded protein where it's characteristic beta sheet insoluble fibrils, just like Alzheimer's. So one target I don't think anybody's looking at, but we are looking at, is somehow to look at inhibiting the heparin sulfate changes that occur in the aging brain that can lead to both beta amyloid protein in plaques, tau tangles in Alzheimer's and CTE, and also alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's disease. So that's some of the things that uh, we are interested in doing some work on sort of privately and secretly. Well, based on your work and your knowledge of the literature, what advice would you give to caregivers as well as patients um, who are wrestling with Parkinson's? You know, Parkinson's is challenging. It's a pretty tough disease. Many strategies to go after the trying to treat the symptoms to improve the quality of life, right? So physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, that's all there to maintain mobility and communication skills. Notice they're not going at they're they don't have the cure and they don't have the real treatment. You know, medications like levodopa and dopamine antagonists are commonly used to manage the motor symptoms and deep brain stimulation offers relief in some patients. People recommend they go to support groups and counseling for emotional support. You know, somebody asked Michael J. Fox, it really struck me, like, are you depressed about having Parkinson's? Like, how do you deal with? And he says, I'm depressed every day 
you know, it's in his head every day and he just has to deal with it. You know, and sometimes in his life he was more depressed than others. So obviously support groups, family members, all important in trying to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's. So basically you don't have a cure. You're trying to manage your movement disorders. And so that's what is very important to cope with it until a cure is found or a really good treatment is found. At least they picked up on how to diagnose it early. So again, you want to find out if you have it early and then how you're going to deal with it. That's going to be the next phase. Yeah, well, I appreciate you simplifying this complex topic and helping people think about and understand the disease, but also thinking about how to how to mitigate and, and treat it as best we can based on the, the research that we have. So I appreciate you discussing this very important topic today. Yeah, thank you, Scott. It's been a pleasure discussing this important topic. You know, if you or someone you know is affected by Parkinson's, remember that you are not alone. Support groups, medical professional, and ongoing research are all here to help. So I think that's important. Yeah, well, thank, thank you everyone who's joined us today. And if you haven't already, please click the subscribe button and give us a, a thumbs up. We, uh, we're always looking to continue these conversations about brain health and helping people live their best lives. Great, thanks a lot, Scott. Thank you, Dr. Snow.